California's weird Z-shaped faults could trigger a larger earthquake in the Southern California area. The Z-shaped faults being the locked, zipped in, locked San Andreas and Garlic Fault. San Andreas, the largest fault in California. The Garlic Fault is almost perpendicular to that in the area just north of Los Angeles. The Garlic Fault is the second largest fault in California. And where it meets the Walker Lane Fault System is where we have Ridgecrest, where we had last year's 7.1 magnitude earthquake. Now, the two big earthquakes at Ridgecrest last year increased the chances of a San Andreas Fault earthquake because we know that nearby earthquakes, nearby faults are juggled by, they're jolted by big earthquakes in the region. Now, it's impossible for us to know when the San Andreas Fault will rupture for a big earthquake. A trembler that could impact almost 13 million people who live in the Los Angeles metro area. But it appears that two other nearby faults might have some say in this. The San Andreas Fault is part of the giant Z of faults. The top of the Z consists of the Ridge Fault, the Ridgecrest Fault. The middle is the garlic and the bottom is the southern part of the famous San Andreas Fault. Of the top of the Z, Ridgecrest Fault, where we have the really big earthquake last year of uh, what they they were they uh, were to have a big earthquake, seven point five that could trigger an earthquake on the middle of the Z garlic fault. This could cause a massive earthquake along the bottom of the Z, the San Andreas. Now this ridge crest of seven point five could trigger a bigger size earthquake in the lower San Andreas, the SoCal region. These successive earthquakes would not necessarily happen together, but over a period of time, it could even take decades, because as the stress builds up and gets transferred from one fault to the next, this could happen. This is what the study co-author Ross Stein, geophysicist and founder and CEO of Trembler, a company that models and assesses earthquake risk, says that we are describing what we're describing is not likely and it's a kind of an earthquake chain reaction but what we've learned over the last four months is chain reactions really do happen in nature and if we're unprepared we may have enormous circumstances well we saw this chain reaction just before the um, foreshock to the ridge crest the foreshock happened on july 4th the morning of july 4th that was a 6.5 and thank goodness it happened because people were alerted and ready for the 7.1 that happened a day later in the evening. So it happened around 8 o'clock after 8 p.m. People were outside. It was just still 4th of July weekend. So thank goodness it was also in an area that was not uh, overly populated in Ridgecrest. But they, well, let's not forget that also Ridgecrest lies in the Coso Volcanic Field. There's magma under there. That's why they have a geothermal plant in Ridgecrest. So the garlic fault, uh, the garlic fault is relatively quiet. It has not released a significant earthquake, they said, in 500 years. But if the garlic fault ruptures within about 30 miles of its junction with San Andreas, it could raise the likelihood of a San Andreas earthquake to the southeast, the so-called Mojave section, by a factor of about 150. This is what Stein, the study co-author, professor of natural disaster research who specializes in seismology at the Tohoku University of Japan, wrote on Trembler uh, explaining, saying, we thus estimate the net change of a large San Andreas earthquake in the next 12 months to be 1.15% or one chance in 87. Such an earthquake could be catastrophic. Were a magnitude 7.8 earthquake to hit the southern San Andreas fault, it could cause more than 1,800 deaths, 50,000 injuries, and $200 billion in damages and other losses, according to a 2008 report by the U.S. Geological Survey. Triggered by an earthquake? Now, let's remember, or we pointed this out, that we first had July 2nd solar eclipse over the area. July 3rd, we had the Bella Bella earthquake north of Vancouver Island, Canada, that was a 6.2 magnitude. And 13 hours later, on July 4th in the morning, we had the 6.4 magnitude 
which was a foreshock to the 7.1 on July 5th. Uh, that's not the only time that we had an earthquake that shook uh, Ridgecrest. We had one in the year 2015. That was also a 6.2 earth magnitude earthquake in Bella Bella, Canada, north of Vancouver Island. But that one took 24 hours to uh, hit Ridgecrest. The stress was transferred to Ridgecrest. But Ridgecrest only had like a 3.5 magnitude earthquake at that time. So this was a, a, this uh, Bella Bella uh, 6.2 magnitude earthquake last year only took 13 hours to hit Ridgecrest. The stress got uh, moved down. And let's remember Ridgecrest is on the Walker Lane fault system. That's a fault system that pushes towards the Cascadia Arc northwest. Now Ridgecrest, they say here, has a humbled experience. This is what Stein uh, told Live Science. She says, I think anybody would have told you that given how well mapped California is, that any fault that can release a 7.1 magnitude would have been known, and it was unknown. That's not the first time that garlic, um, that Ridgecrest had a 7.1. They had a 7.1 in 1999 as well. Now, the Ridgecrest area is no stranger to big earthquakes. Over the past 150 years, the area has experienced four earthquakes that registered magnitude 7 or higher. The, the at least magnitude 7.6 that struck Owens Valley in 1872, the magnitude 7.3 in Kern County in 1952, the magnitude 7.3 that hit Landers in 1992, and the magnitude 7.1 that shook Hector in 1999. All of these earthquakes added stress to the Ridgecrest Fault, and that meant that while they did not directly cause the uh, last year's earthquake, they likely promoted them, Stein said. But the area's big earthquakes don't happen like clockwork, so it's challenging to know when the next powerful one might hit. So to forecast when the next massive earthquake might strike, Stein and Toda developed a new forecasting method. And to be clear, it says here a forecast is not the same as a prediction because it's impossible to predict earthquakes. Instead, forecasts look at probability or the chance that an earthquake of a certain magnitude might happen in a given place at a period of time. And this machine learning model looked at how stress was transformed by earthquakes. It used past earthquakes to test its accuracy. And the model shows that the June 2020 Ridgecrest earthquakes fit into the forecast for the region. That is, today, that is today's period, this year. The model showed in part because of the added stress from the recent Ridgecrest earthquakes that the garlic fault has a 2.3% chance of producing a magnitude 7.7 .7 earthquake next year, or 1 in 43 probability. This chance is 100 times higher than the chance given by the third California earthquake rupture forecast, USURF 3, a forecast that's put out by Southern California Earthquake Center and California Geological Survey and released in 2017. So it, this possible magnitude 7.7 .7 or even a magnitude 7.5 earthquake along garlic fault as uh, shown by the model, could trigger a large earthquake along the Mojave section of the San Andreas Fault. This is what the uh, geologist and Stein explained. Now, what should Californians do? There's another way of looking at the 1.15 chance that San Andreas Fault will rupture, triggering the big one earthquake, and it's, there is a 98.85% chance that it will not happen. Even so, it's good that the public and public policy experts are aware of this chance. Stein said it could also serve as a gentle reminder. People living in the San Andreas South SoCal area should re retrofit their homes to make them earthquake ready and assemble earthquake preparedness kits by earthquake insurance, etc. And Stein says if you're a homeowner, you've been on the fence about earthquake insurance because it's too expensive. Keep in mind that your risk, just, your risk just went up by a factor of 3.5 to 5. It does not appear that insurance companies are raising rates because of the study, so you're basically getting insurance at a colossal discount. Another geophysicist points out that the new studies model does not account for the Earth's intricacies. For instance, the model does not incorporate complexities of fluid interactions. We can change stress on faults over time and it does not factor in the different types of rock in the region. 
As Stein said that since the study came out in the journal Bulletin of Seismological Society of America a couple of days ago on July 14, he's taking, he's talked with a number of colleagues who pointed out issues with the model. Many of the issues are addressed in the study's supplementary data, he said, so the models can never completely mimic real-world situations. He said, I feel that what we're saying is speculative and it's uncertain, and we acknowledge that, and we understand that. But the flip side of that coin is the consequences of this are so important that we should try to estimate it, and this should start a discussion of what we should be putting into our models of earthquake occurrence. And this is on live science. Please leave your comments. Thank you. If you'd like to join me on my Patreon account, you will hear content not covered by mainstream media. These riveting stories will be based on my research and I will state my opinions and give my personal insight on diverse and controversial subjects and world events, events not covered by mainstream media and not certainly on not supported by YouTube guidelines. So whatever I have on my Patreon, most of those will not be on my YouTube channel. Please consider becoming a member today. More of the, the most significant and important videos will be on my Patreon channel. Your support helps me to continue my research and keeps this YouTube channel alive. And we depend on your support, your generous charity, because we help economically challenged families here in Athens, Greece. In Kapota, and we also help the young generation with university tuition and the community around our church. Thank you.